Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Matthew Feeney. And today we welcome back Brian Wilson. He's co-founder of Combat and Classics, a program out of St. John's that organizes free online seminars on classic texts for active duty, reserve, and veteran U.S. military. He also leads discussions for the Partially Examined Life podcast non-school program. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me back. Last time we had you on, we did Plato's Apology. Socrates' defense before the people of Athens when they had him on trial for impiety and corrupting the youth. And today we are doing the next dialogue in that sequence, which is the Credo. So when we start by having you tell us what's the, the context for this particular discussion? Yeah, so the the Credo, uh, and if you haven't listened to the first one, it's spoilers ahead. Uh, Socrates is found guilty. So now he's in prison. Uh, but the issue at hand that he's wrestling here in the credo is um, he can get out, right? That's that's the pitch, um, and the the subtext is that he that that the government of Athens probably not a big deal because there was the talk of him being exiled uh, as an option prior. Um, so he is just going to talk with Credo about you know is it would it be right for me to ignore the verdict? Would it be right for me to leave? Um, and so, you know, jumping right in, it, it's there's, you know, it's it's like we were talking about before we went live. It's there's there's a much more hit you over the head libertarian theme on this one a little bit, but I also think there's a there's a lot of ambiguity that you can chew on in this one, um, and like a lot of Socratic dialogues, um, and I always kind of harken back to the Republic with this, is, you know, is is Socrates really laying out a cogent argument here? Is he really – and I think this is something for the listeners to think through as we talk about this and then hopefully you're kind of spurred on to read it. And so whether you're just listening in or whether you're reading, it's – you know, ask yourself in, in very specific terms and very like, OK, I need to define my terms. Is Socrates being consistent? So I, just, I wanted to start off with um, a line in 46C where him and Credo are already kind of in the mix and, and talking about these different options. And Socrates says – I value and respect the same principles as before. And if we have no better arguments to bring up at this moment, be sure that I shall not agree with you, not even if the power of the majority were to frighten us with more bogeys, as if we were children with threats of incarcerations and executions and confiscation of property. So like other St. John's uh, seminars, you know, we start off with an opening question and then we just try to help each other learn. So – Socrates is laying out this excuse to Credo about why he's not going to break out of the jail um, and he brings up this concept of the majority. But how, for, the question for you all is how is that different than what got him here in jail in the first place? Yeah, I think it's a very interesting question because uh, in the previous episode, we discussed the trial uh, and an argument could be made um, that he was – well. This is what happened, that there was a, a big jury that found him guilty and that's uh, in some sense a majority rule. So the, the, on the one hand, he seems to have this uh, reverence or respect for the state but also to be skeptical of majority rule, which I, I think is a very interesting uh, two set of beliefs to hold at once. It's interesting that when he starts presenting the arguments for why he shouldn't run away – so Credo has shown up and said, look, basically we can bribe people to get you out. It's not going to cost that much. People are kind of expecting us to do it. It will be easy and Socrates says no. When he starts offering these arguments and Credo has said, yeah, like look, the, you know, people are – it's going to hurt my reputation mm -hmm. if I don't bust you out of here because people are expecting it and Socrates will, why the hell should you care about the, what the majority thinks of you? You should only care about the people who are right. But when he starts giving the reasons why he needs to stay, he slides into – Speaking in the voice of the state, he says, I'm, I'm speaking – I can imagine the – I think he says the laws and constitution of Athens saying and then it shifts into – it's now personified. It's no longer – so like the, the trial represented the, the will of the majority which he seems to be very much opposed to. But when he's presenting the arguments for why he ought to obey the will of the majority, suddenly it's no longer the will of the majority but this like personified state. I think it's I, – see, I take it a little more ambi ambiguous ambiguity there 
than than the state, right? So I'm trying to be very specific. And maybe it says the state in your translation, but in my translation, it just says the laws. Right, it says the laws and constitution. So, and I, where does it say the constitution? Help me out on that one. I'm trying to find it. It's in my translation. Because you know, I'm reading this as the law, and I feel like with the law, you know, you get into a fuzzier place than the state, right? If he had just said the state. Mm, you know he's not going to he's not going to sell me as much but if he's talking about the law and especially like he said in the apology with his daimon right this daimon this you know kind of god that he follows is the god of reason and he doesn't mention the daimon right he doesn't mention reason he doesn't mention virtue right he just mentions the laws and what the laws are saying and it's fascinating to me that he has has a, have has to have this conversation with himself, right? That he can't even use Credo as his interlocutor, which is what he does in a lot of situations. So maybe Credo's really dumb. That's an option, right? Um, or he's trying to give voice to this alternative and either trying to talk himself into or out of it or talking Credo into or out of it. But you know, by his actions, he stays. So it's just very confusing to me. Where he says this, you know, why should I respect the majority? And the earlier part is very much about, you know, you need to find the person that understands good opinion, that has a mm-hmm. good opinion to do good and you follow that. Like just like a trainer, you follow the trainer that knows what he's talking about. You do that and ignore the majority. And yet here we are where he's in jail because the majority of the jury put him there and then he's following – or at least arguing with himself via this disembodied thing, the laws. Well, he does. So here I found the. Um, okay. So this is my edition. Only says it's somewhere between forty-eight E and fifty A, mm-hmm. but. Um, it says, look at it this way. Suppose that while we were preparing to run away from here, the laws and constitution of Athens were to come and confront us and ask this question. Now, Socrates, what are you proposing to do? He then later says um, – so the, the, again, the laws and constitution are speaking and say, so far as you have the power to destroy us, the laws and the whole state as well. But it's this, – this argument he's having with himself, it is true he kind of cuts Credo out of the whole thing. But there's this weird admission at the end where – so almost all of the arguments he makes, which we'll go through, are simply him speaking in this imagined voice. Mm-hmm. Like it's like he's not giving his own – views or even asking the kinds of questions that aren't like, these aren't really my reviews. I'm just asking. That's so typical of Socrates. But instead, it's in his, all of his speeches in quotes as the laws and constitution of Athens. But at the end, he, he says, that my dear friend Credo, I do assure you is what I seem to hear them saying just as a mystic seems to hear the strains of music and the sound of their arguments rings so loudly in my head that I cannot hear the other side. Mm-hmm. It's like this isn't even a dialogue. It's just – it's like a monologue of the voice in his head and he's not willing to even entertain or listen to counter arguments. Yeah, and uh, 51C, uh, the, the, the translation I have at least says um, the, the laws might say uh, – the laws might say uh, – and, and then he goes on to talk about uh, the sort of things that uh, the laws provide and that Socrates should probably be thankful for. And he mentioned things like you know, educating him and uh, raising him. And it's a fascinating point, I think, because the context of this is so, uh, I think, intuitively frightening. He's facing certain death. Uh, and making an argument that to uh, libertarians like us is, is, is rather disturbing, saying that uh, there's some sort of obligation to the entity that raised you, that uh, educated you. And it's an argument you hear, I think, uh, quite often actually uh, outside of uh, seminar rooms when discussing uh, texts like this, this uh, that the, the laws are worth respecting or the state is worth respecting because without it, uh, what would you be? You, you're here because of it. I think you know it's very tricky, right? Because if the laws are just, then you must do just by them, right? And that's kind of the layer beneath this idea of laws, right? He, you know, Socrates says he's like, I can't do injustice, right? Even even if I have been unjustly tried, right? I can't do that. But you know, he doesn't address the question if the laws are just or not, right? It's just, and and I feel like this. This disembodied laws conversation is important to the dialogue. You know, he, he's not he's not presenting this to Credo. He's not saying, Credo, don't you believe that you know the laws nurtured you, then the laws raised you and gave you this ability? He's not making that argument to Credo. 
he's arguing with the laws in his own head. And you know, I just think you know. Sometimes you know, I take there's there's a part in the book four of the Republic where they're talking about. I think I brought this up in the last pod where they Glaucon, you know, in the formation of their ideal state, asks him, "Okay, well, you've provided for all the basic necessities without a state, but you know, don't you want a footstool?" And Socrates is like, "Oh, you want a footstool now? Okay, well, now we need gold people and silver people and bronze people and guardians and all this stuff." And I almost take. The rest of the republic is kind of a satire or a joke, as you know, like this is what you need to provide this, which is also not true. But it's you know, it's I feel like it's a similar you know conception of you know if the laws are just, then I cannot do injustice by them. I can't just leave. I can't use bribery. But the system is set up that way. It's you know he's within this system. He's within Athenian justice, and there's some part of Athenian. It, whether it's beyond the law, there's some part of Athenian culture that is saying to Socrates, "It's okay. Like you can just, you know, put a bribe in. You can go to Thessaly. You can get out of here, and it's no big deal." But he has this conception of this dialogue with the laws that is forcing him to stay, and I, I don't understand it. You know, so he doesn't seem to. He seems to, on the one hand, take a procedural view of justice like the law is structured to do these certain things and the the law has spoken because we had a trial and I was condemned I was found guilty so it would be violating the law irregardless of its its content right um, well you can look at this in two ways right I think and maybe this is where you were going like you know what what came to my mind a lot of times is you know letter from Birmingham jail right so you have this idea of you know that peace and love is what drives mankind's relationships with one another, and that if you oppress one, you oppress the many, and and there's this you know beautiful eloquence in that, and something that that stirs your conscience and puts right in your face this idea of just versus unjust laws, and also this conception of sacrifice. It's like if you want me to sit here, I'll sit here. That's fine, but you can't stop where this is going. Whereas with Socrates, what why why not? Make a message like that. Why not have a message of of rebellion, of of still knowledge and justice and peace, but rebellion at the same time? And I feel like that that is that's missing from this. And how to have how do how do you have a fully logical, a fully reasonable account of your actions without an understanding of the nature of rebellion, of the nature of saying no, this is not right? And I feel like. There, there's something in there and this is why I hang out with smart guys like you to help me understand this better is there's something in there that's missing and I feel like that it's something around this dialogue with himself vis-a-vis -vis the laws. Well, he does mention um, – again, when he's speaking for the law, he, he has them say like, look, you had an opportunity to persuade us. Like it, it feels like that, that notion of saying no and that notion of rebellion – comes in under the idea of persuasion, that if you disagree, the thing to do is not to disobey because he thinks that disobeying destroys the law, which then destroys the state, um, or to run off but to make the attempt to persuade, which is what he arguably did, although we can question how good of a job he did or if he was even intentionally – like if he was trying to persuade. Yeah. Um, but he made that attempt and failed. But I – the thing that I was going to say is that he's – so he's got this – he says, look, it's, it's good because there's this procedure and the, the laws give us this procedure and I was found guilty. But it seems like the way that Credo is presenting the come on, look, we can get you out and it will be easy and the expectation is that you will is that part of this procedure is then and if you're found guilty, then we can buy off the guards and you can run. Like this is the expectation and so it's, it's not clear why the finding guilty is part of – this grander law, um, you know, that the jury finds him this way, but the getting out of jail, which is expected, is not. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a pretty good take on it. Uh, I, I do think uh, there's a good chance here that Socrates is worried about the reputation here, uh, and of course, the dialogue starts with Credo saying. Well, you know, this will make me look bad, uh, and Socrates doesn't seem to care. Uh, and I do wonder um, if if they had just gone off to Thessaly, uh, what Socrates' reputation might have been. 
but it's hard for me to get into the mindset of um, Socrates given what you said a little earlier, which was that he, he might just treat this as a rhetorical battle lost, that he stood in front of hundreds of people and tried to make a case and failed and he's willing to suffer the ultimate consequence of that. And like we discussed in the last episode, he knew that he was you know, guilty um, and didn't exactly treat the uh, the jury with much respect um, with the first verdict. Uh, but again, this is a, how much of this is rhetorical flourish? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there's a lot in here as far as you know things that are maybe pointed at us as libertarians, right? And you know, in the line that Matthew was just mentioning at the end of 52, when he's quoting the laws and he's saying the laws would say, surely they might say, you're breaking the commitments and agreements that you made with us without compulsion or deceit and under no pressure of time for deliberation. You've had 70 years during which you could have gone away if you did not like us and if you thought our agreements unjust. You did not choose to go to Sparta or to Crete, which you are always saying are well governed, nor to any other city, Greek or foreign, and so there's you know that that critique of, of us where we're like why are why are we spending so much on entitlements and you know and they're like well if you don't like it go move to Somalia right and yet we don't so you know th this this makes me kind of wrestle with that conception of you know is there some other innate piece of this that you know man and the place he is born and raised are tied together on some level that's beyond you know just this conception of justice or just this conception of the laws it's a very worrying uh, conception of consent if you ask me uh it and it is as as you pointed out i'm i'm sure everyone at this uh, table has heard the argument before well you could move to canada or you could move to australia or yeah. something like that um which ties into two two thoughts that always come to my mind when this happens. Number one, values are subjective and you might be annoyed about some things the American government does but you don't hate them enough that you would leave. But secondly, it's the the, the – the moral burden seems the wrong way around in a strange way that like it's, it's up to me to exit this, um, this uh, institution uh, that I didn't have a choice in uh, specifically where I was born. Uh, and I, I think you know I've discussed this with Aaron um, off mic before and I know he thinks uh, along the similar lines. Is that fair? I don't want to put words in your mouth, Aaron. But yeah. Yeah, I Aaron mean, is nodding. Don't yeah, <laughs> like, so I want to – I mean as an aside, one of the – every – so three times a year because we have three intern semesters, three intern classes come through Cato each year and for each one I give a talk about the problem of political obligation and authority and whether we have a duty to obey the law and the text that I assign them is the credo um, and the reason that I assign it is not just because it's great and everyone should read as much Plato as you can but because the arguments that Socrates offers, so this one that – you just brought up, Brian, which is an implicit consent argument are basically the same arguments that people make today for why we have a duty to obey the state and all of the major arguments, the kinds of arguments that get made today really show up in some form in the credo. So it's that Alfred Whitehead's quip that all of philosophy is footnotes to Plato really shows up here with the credo. But this is this is this really troubling thing. I mean, we know that Socrates, Socrates is like the consummate Athenian. He, I mean, he's he mentions like he's never really left the city. He had some military adventures earlier on, but since then he's he hasn't left the city. He had no desire to leave the city. Athens is what he loves. It's it's the place he wants to be. And so the cost of leaving, of heading off to some other town, is enormous for him. And these burdens do seem Quite high, um, and so that that you know, love it or leave it argument that we as libertarians get all the time, I think, really underappreciates how embedded we are in our culture, our way of life, our society, our friends, our family. Um, that that stuff it, it discounts that. That I mean, this was Hume has an objection to this argument um, in his essay. I think it's called on the social contract. Uh, where he just says like, look, you know, you say just take off and leave if you don't like it and that this – and that sticking around is evidence that you have implicitly signed on to this social contract. But when you are a poor workman um, and you – you know, this is the only world you've known. This is the only language you know. Like it's not really an option. It has to be a legitimate choice. And what so for Socrates, it seems very clear that leaving is not a 
real choice for him and never really was. Well, I mean, it, it, you know, the the idea of a, I mean, really, it's a quasi cultural shift, right? Because if he goes to anywhere in Greece, they're going to speak the same language. There'll be a bit of a patois, but nothing that shocking. There are, you know, government entities that are well governed, and that's laid out as well. But it's like what what is keeping in there? And I mean, I don't know if Matthew wants to talk about. I mean, I don't know exactly where you're from, Matthew. I'm based on your accent. I'm assuming like somewhere in Alabama. But um, Close. <laughs> <laughs> but it's you know it's like why why stay and why go, and especially if death is your is your other option, huh. doesn't it doesn't make sense to me to a point. Yeah, although I think uh, some of it might be to to make a point that uh, I can't imagine making but Socrates as an ancient Greek probably could, which is to put justice as an ideal uh, more important than your own life. And at uh, 43b, he, uh, he, he says, um, speaking for the, you know, the laws, um, so be convinced by we who brought you up, Socrates, and do not put children or life or anything else ahead of justice. And I just find that uh, mindset a little boggling uh, myself uh, and it seems I, not to mean that I don't think uh, justice isn't important but uh, I can't imagine being willing to sit in a prison with an open door with a cup of hemlock and thinking I'll drink this rather than uh, <laughs> flee. How does that line factor – play though with the idea that – so of course this – you know you always have to – mentioned that we don't actually know what were Socrates' ideas versus mm -hmm. Plato's ideas right. and these early dialogues probably represent Socrates more than the later ones, say the Republic do, which are more Plato's ideas. But the Republic is about the nature of justice um, but it's a – what we – it's ultimately like it's an individual virtue. Like this entire metaphor that he constructs in the Republic of the virtuous city is just to get at what does it mean for justice in the individual. And so if that's true and justice is a virtue then of people instead of say institutions, then it would seem that this um, allegiance to justice that he has where we can't place anything else above it would seem to leave open or necessitate the questioning of, OK, great, then – but if justice is something about me, then if the jury says X but X is not just, then justice says ignore the jury. Yeah, I mean the, the, the strangest thing about this um, given our perspective is, is that he seems guilty of something that we might describe as a thought crime, that he's – or, or yeah. just thinking the wrong things and um, influencing the youth. And people um, in the world today who sit in prison cells because they've said the wrong things, uh, I, I hope would intuitively think, well, the state is being unjust. I'm not the you know that that's the problem. The problem here isn't that I just lost an argument in a, in a courtroom. The problem is, is that the law is bad and that's the real injustice and it doesn't seem to occur to Socrates that that's a, a point worth um, seriously considering. Uh, I mean although he does mention of course majority – the importance of majorities. And, and it's, it's so troubling, right? Because – well, it's troubling in that you know, there, there are so many people, um, you know, kind of icons of philosophy of religion or whatever that are willing to martyr themselves for – an ideal of justice that that transcends the state to one degree or another, right? And it's mostly death and rebellion to the state, right? It's people that are going to stand up to the the state's power, the state's apparatus, no matter what you know form it might take. I mean, whether it's you know Mohammed Bozadeh, who's you know credited with starting the Arab Spring, that just lit himself on fire because of the amount of permitting that was required. You know, he just wanted to open a little corner food shop. And you know, the government wouldn't let him, right? So we we somehow empathize with that and and understand it to a to a degree in this idea of rebellion, this idea that you know sometimes rebellion causes or requires death. But this is this is <laughs> it's a rebellion, but it it isn't, you know. And it, it's it's something that's just so hard for me to wrap myself around. And it's somebody that you know he he Socrates was the gadfly, right? He was questioning everything, and the state doesn't like it. And we talked about in the apology how he specifically said he's like I've gone out of my way to not talk about politics because I know you guys are going to kill me if I do that, right? And the state gets its way. <laughs> like he doesn't talk about politics, and now he's here, kind of saying 
taking this idea of the laws and laying it out very explicitly and maybe agreeing with it and accepting death rather than saying, no, this is wrong. No, there is a sense of justice outside of this. Well, in, uh, we discussed this in the last episode, uh, but when discussing the possibility of death, he um, seems to have a different conception of it than we might have. He says on the one hand, well, the worst that happens is I just go to sleep. But think about this. I could also spend the rest of my time hanging out with some really smart guys and uh, just talking philosophy all day. And uh, I suppose his, his fear of death – and we have to remember he's an old man uh, – and you know, traveling all the way to Thessaly as an exile, you know, is um, not an insignificant thing. So it might just be, uh, you know, don't romance it too much, but that uh, this, the course of action he takes, makes sense um, given the the context and what he actually thinks about death. I feel like that's another giant contradiction that, at least in my mind, that I don't buy. I don't buy the huh. "I'm old, it's not a big deal." Mm-hmm. You know, like I've seen this. In, in like the Marine Corps, right? When you're – when you have 24, 25-year-old guys and they're in Iraq and they can stare death in the face and like they're OK. You know, they, they know what they're in for and they know that that's a you know, possible result of their actions, of their being there. But I also, you know, I have a lot of older folks in their 60s and 70s that, you know, come to the seminars and that I talk to significantly and and their grip on life is tight. <laughs> you know, they, I, I don't, you know, I hear, um, you know, things that, that jibe with death before dishonor from, you know, folks in their late teens and 20s. Uh, I don't, I don't hear, you know, from 72-year-olds that I have conversations with like, nah, it's not a big deal. You know, I, I, I don't. It's it's you know and it it I'm sure there are people out there that might think that but it's it's tricky for me to wrap my head around that. So this is probably not the case, but part of me wants to think like okay, so he knows he's not long for this world regardless because he's pretty old and I mean he's pretty old by our standards and so he's quite old by the ancient world standards. Um, and if the people of Athens, so Socrates is certainly not a fan of democracy. He loves Athens but he does not like democracy. But the people of Athens have made this dumb decision to kill him. He's He has like – he's like, OK. Well, if you're, you've made this dumb decision to prosecute me and so now I'm going to show you. I'm going to make you convict me, like do something even dumber. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to do something even dumber by putting me to death. And now you're all sitting around like thinking, hey, he can get out of this. Hey, he can get out of this. You know, It will be easy and we're expecting it. But I'm going to show you. Like I'm going to be a gadfly to the end by making you actually carry this out. Yeah, yeah. I think that really does come through uh, when, in during the trial, given the chance to, pr- after being found guilty, he's given the chance of proposing some kind of punishment, and he just to be annoying, knowing that this would have t- just proposes a pension. Uh, like he must have known, I think. Uh, but getting uh, b- back to back to this text, uh, I, I I think. I'd love to hear what both of you think about um, the concept uh, and we've discussed it um, I think on on, on um, a little layer of it, uh, the concept of duty um, and where it comes from and why why the allegiance to uh, the laws um, is a good thing because I think that discussion is kind of uh, worth having. Uh, it, it seems very important to Socrates especially. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about 51D, right? Where, where he so, says, yeah. "Yeah, we have given you birth, nurtured you, educated you. We have given you and all other citizens a share of all the good things we could." Mm-hmm. Do you buy that? Well, not particularly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, th- you know, it's uh, it, it gets worse. Uh, it gets worse uh, when they say, th- "I think this is the right passage," um, and that whether it is to be beaten or imprisoned or to be wounded or killed. If she, so the laws um, or the homeland, leads you into war, you must do it. Like this sort of, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm buying much of this, uh, but that shouldn't be too surprising, I suppose. Right, but it's very troubling because these are all things that, through his actions, he follows through on. And so there's there's another huge curveball for me: is that he went to war, right, multiple times. He was called to war and he went, right. The laws or the state call him to die, and he does that. And so, I mean, I love 
your narrative, Aaron, of, you know, he's just being a gadfly to the end. That gives me some hope, you know, some like little happy thread to hold on to. But I don't know if it's true. I can't like say, no, it's, it's very specific. He says right here. I think that there's contradiction in what he says. You know, when he talks about at the end of about going to Thessaly, um, you know, at the end of 53 at 53, um, and he's basically saying there, he's like, people will think bad of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just said he doesn't care. Like he just said this entire time that he doesn't care what the majority thinks. You know, he only cares what what is right. And so he's laying out this long argument. This whole last you know uh, page is about what will people think of you if you go to this other place? Like how will they you know view you and what you've done? And it's well, why do you care? Why do you care what the majority thinks? Right. So wrapping my head around what I see as contradictions and what I see as logical fallacies, but looking at his actions, it's what he follows through on, and it's 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 tough. It's tough for me to wrap my head around. Yeah, and uh, I, I think fifty three e also includes a, a passage that I quite liked when he says, uh, "Let me find this." Oh yeah, will no one say? that an old man who probably only has a short time left in his life was so greedy in his desire to live that he dared uh, to violate the greatest laws. Perhaps not if you do not annoy anyone. And <laughs> so, uh, well, what's the chances of Socrates being annoying? Right. Well, exactly. Yeah. So a lot of this, this duty to obey the state argument and it takes – I mean as he presents it and he makes the same argument – several times. He repeats himself a fair amount when he's speaking as the laws. But it, a lot of it breaks down into two main categories, I think, um, three possibly. So there's one that, that looks like a kind of natural duty argument, which is like you recognize that you have a duty to obey your father um, and that that's just part of who you are and what it means to have a father and be a son. Um, the state is like a – and the laws are a super father and so therefore like if if it applied a little bit there, boy, does it apply a lot here. Um, then there's this implicit consent argument about you could have left at any time or you could have told us you didn't like this stuff. Well, of course, that's what he did at his trial um, but you didn't so therefore you have implicitly signed on to obey and then the third seems to be this gratitude account which is the like – we gave you life. We educated you. We provided you with all this awesome stuff and this is how you repay us. Um, and and all of these are the same arguments that we hear today all the time with the love it or leave it or you know, these institutions are awesome. Um, the, the kind of like founding fathers are awesome theory of government um, or the like you didn't build that. You know, you you use the public schools, and now you have to repay it. Um, and it seems like the mistake, and it, it it seems like a contradiction. What he's saying too is this confusion of like, yes, he probably does have duties to this society that that helped him out and played a key role in raising him. Yes, he stuck around in this society, um, and yes, it gave him things. Um, it provided and. It provided him with an education and enabled him to provide, I mean, ultimately all of humanity with an education. Um, but but those are things about Athens, right? Those aren't necessarily things about this particular government that happens to be the one that set down this law about impiety and corrupting the youth and convened this trial. You know, and we know that he's rebelled before. He refused the was it Critias and the the tyrants when they gave him an order to participate in killing someone like he refused to do that on grounds of justice. Um, so he seems to be just flat out confusing like all of his arguments are about why he should respect the people of Athens and feel good about this society that he's in but not necessarily arguments about why the proper way to discharge those duties or the proper way to demonstrate gratitude um, or the proper way to show this this consent is to obey the laws versus – helping out his society in some way, which is the argument libertarians make all the time. Like, great, yes, I was I was educated and gained lots of things. So now let me start a business that will give lots of people jobs or invent something that will radically change everyone's life. I'd rather not just give that money so that we can use it to drop bombs on people. Well, I, I love that you raised um, the issue of, of, of duties 
uh, and uh, particularly as it relates to parents because that's an issue that Credo raises explicitly uh, in the dialogue saying, I think you are betraying your sons whom you could raise and educate by going away and abandoning them. And as far as you are concerned, they can experience whatever happens to come their way when it's likely that as orphans, they'll get the usual treatment of orphans. One should either not have children or endure the hardship of raising and educating them. But it looks to me as though you are taking the laziest path. And it's like interesting that Credo seems to think this will be a tug, like he, he, appealing to Socrates. Like, OK, like you can't uh, argue against that duty. Like this, this looks bad. And Socrates does saying, at present, I am um, not going to abandon the arguments I previously made. Uh, and that, that, that really is a, a, an astonishing part of the dialogue. And Credo you know, uses the, the cliche, think of the kids. And uh, it's still not persuasive. Yeah, it's tricky. I am. Um you know, I was, I was thinking as, as you were talking, Aaron, just about like, you know, our kind of doctrinal foundation for libertarianism. We talked about this a little bit in the, in the apology is you, know, you, you usually start somewhere, right? You start from some idea of like, you know, I own me uh, or something like the non-aggression principle. And I'm just wondering if even though Socrates maybe didn't carry it to its full um, – full blossom, right, which we potentially see with him uh, kind of succumbing to some degree mentally and physically to the state. But having a starting point of a libertarian ideal of, I don't know, I'm, I'm the least wise man in Athens, you know, and, and where, do you get, where do you get from a political philosophy based on I don't know or based on I don't know, I can't always make good decisions, you know, about what I should be doing. You know, much less what I am going to demand at gunpoint of someone else. And I've been messing around with this. I, I did the Crito uh, for Partially Examined Life uh, a few weeks ago. I did a seminar on that. And, you know, that question just kind of popped into my head and, and, and I just kind of asked that idea of like, you know, how do you, how do you have a system of government that is based on, you know, this what we would call almost obvious um, illogic of you know this guy's asking too many questions we got to kill him right and then you get to what would socrates ideal state be like right and i mean it might be this it might be athens because he succumbs to what they demand of him but what if then you could have a conception of the state that is just i don't know i don't i don't i'm not sure about anything which i think then leads you to some kind of at least least harm principle it leads you to almost a hippocratic view of first do no harm and I think that you know, thinking through a lot of stuff based on that, because it really sent me on kind of a deep dive on, you know, let's look at praxeology, let's look at Austrian economics, let's look at all this stuff through the lens of I don't know, I'm not sure as your starting point, and you know, you can almost build out, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of fan, a lot of your listeners are big fans of Euclid and Lobachevsky as far as geometrical systems, and <laughs> so. You can almost start uh, what I think is a is a fairly logical proof where um, you know the parallel lines don't meet, but it's not necessarily ninety degrees. And so instead of starting from this idea of non-aggression or this idea of property, you start from I don't know, I don't know what's best. And you can have some fun kind of rhetorical games with yourself, and it might just be that it might just be rhetorical games. But you can also, I think, the flaws in a lot of uh, political thought and political system uh, around the world come into sharper focus when you stop arguing about – because I've had the property argument in you know, St. John's seminars where we actually don't like ever talk about personal politics, which is hilarious and fun for me too because it's like, oh, you guys don't know what I think. <laughs> um, they probably do after about 20 minutes because I'm not super subtle. Mm-hmm. But you know, starting with this idea of the, this Socratic ideal of I don't know, I think leads you to some really fun places as far as kind of libertarian thought and libertarian ideals, and it, it forces you to. And I, we talked a little bit about this at the end of the apology. We, you know, it, it forces you to really make things that we think we believe in, like I own me, or like I, you know, all I owe you is non-aggression. And it forces you to really crystallize those in your mind, or it forces you to have a little bit of give in that and to examine it a little more closely. 
Well, I know that if uh, regular Free Thoughts host Trevor Burris was here, he would um, jump on the opportunity to talk about skepticism uh, just because uh, I don't know is uh, something I, I find libertarian saying quite often, especially um, in this building. But I think more importantly, it, the, the second question is when people say they do know, the follow-up should be well, how? So in public policy, when people are proposing things um, that often are encroachments on liberties, it behooves us to ask, how do you know uh, what the education system should look like or how we should regulate our food or you know, how, what, what uh, substances you should be allowed to put in your body? And that I think is uh, why skepticism is so valuable and why the Socratic discussion, especially on politics specifically, is so important. I think uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and Nothing is more extraordinary to me than saying, listen, I, I know we've never met, but I know what you should do <laughs> yeah. about your life. So maybe four years ago, um, I published an essay in a book called Why Liberty, edited by Tom Palmer and put out by Students for Liberty and Atlas, um, called I think it called The Humble Case for Liberty, which was this argument. So start with the idea that more or less everything I think is true right now, I could be wrong about to one extent or another. Um, and then where do you go from there? And how do you build a society? And there is the like first do no harm part of it, and there's the there's the call for humility because I think the one one way you could go with that is like, look, we we might be wrong. Um, and so you could take the the rational ignorance argument that says, like, well, the voters don't know anything um, for often very good reasons. Um, so don't let them decide. Let the people who probably ha – who do know, so the technocrats, the experts decide, which is to some extent the kind of argument that Socrates is making here when he's talking about like, look, you shouldn't care about what the majority thinks. Like if you're worried about health, you talk to the doctor. You don't listen. You don't let the people decide. Um, and if you do, you're going to end up unhealthy. Um, and But the – I think the counter to that because that that can lead to really horrific outcomes as we've seen. I mean the 20th century is rife with that sort of stuff is that the experts often lack that humility as well. And so it's – I mean it's funny that Socrates makes this argument because by our standards, those doctors that he thinks are the ones you ought to listen to were often pretty nuts. I mean that medicine was let's just say rather primitive at his time. And so the very fact that this is a 2,000-year-old document like shows that that argument doesn't work quite as well or, or, or at least counsels us to have that level of humility. But I do think there is a there is a strong libertarian case to be made from that starting point of I'm not certain, you're not certain um, that what that means is that even when we try to act correctly, we may do harm because we just don't have enough information. And so at the very least, don't institutionalize it at gunpoint because what that means is that if the the more power you give to the potential errors, like the state decides we should all follow the food pyramid um, and then it turns out like, oh, no, that was not actually that good of an idea. Well, now you've done a lot of damage to all sorts of people who might have chosen otherwise. So at least you're, you're – you know, you don't have that – you reduce the number of negative externalities by – from the error because I'm only affecting me and not you and you as well. Um, but yeah, I think you can spin out a pretty good system from just that simple like I could be wrong statement. I hope everybody's clear about the uh, where you can pick that book up and that this was just a total plug for. Uh, for <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll put a link to it in the show notes. <laughs> we got to move that product, people. Mm -hmm. Podcast doesn't pay for itself. Yeah, so I, I I liked your narrative, Aaron. I liked I liked this concept of of gadfly to the end. But and I, I love the fact that that you guys do this for the interns, um, you know, for every intern class. I think this is a wonderful place to start. It is, you know, there's there's a great what Richard Feynman quote about I would rather have uh, un, unanswered questions than answers that can't be questioned, right? And uh, this is this is the tricky part about Plato, and you know, maybe, maybe you know, maybe the maybe the magic is in economics. Maybe that's why, like, it's such a critical part of like libertarian thought, libertarian ideals, is because you can you can show that cause and effect, and this is where you know Glaucon's footstool is. Uh, that can be the title of your next essay. Go ahead and write that up. Sure. Uh, 
<laughs> is is where things go awry because you know the examples that you gave about you know uh, the doctor or the just the you know the education system that was there was you know guys like Socrates walking around and getting paid to just kind of walk around with their retinue with their posse and rhetorize right and Socrates didn't like that he he said you know these guys are full of it but it was still a quasi free market system and he didn't see a discrepancy there between that and the state and uh i, I mean these these economic questions are are in there this thing just goes everywhere doesn't it well, I, I really enjoy uh, a privilege of working uh, at the Cato Institute is I get to sit sometimes in the back of the class as uh, Aaron talks to these interns and you can tell by the uh, the body language that the first few minutes are rather uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, and th- what's, what's, uh, what's fun about this is I think – and the reason why this is such a valuable dialogue to read if you're interested in political theory is – if you do believe that democracy is a good system and that majorities rule and that you ought to obey the laws because you have a duty to the state or uh, you should have gratitude or you've ha- you have some sort of social contract, well, this is potentially uh, what it will look like on the receiving end uh, if you happen to have the wrong ideas or do the wrong sort of thing. Uh, that's – this is – uh, I, I like that Socrates is the, the logical anti-libertarian on this point that he's just – I guess this is uh, this is what's going to end up happening. Uh, and, and that I – of course, I, I uh, you know read read this dialogue before I was a libertarian uh, but I enjoy it much more now. Yeah, it's a, I mean it's a wonderfully rich dialogue um, as are all of these. I encourage – we – probably the, the one following this, um, Fido, mm. I – we probably will not discuss on an episode of Free Thoughts because it's not on a topic remotely related to what we talk about in this show. But I encourage everyone to read it as well because there is, I mean, just the these four dialogues in these last days of Socrates as works of literature stand among the best that have ever been produced. And Socrates as a character, and I. I challenge anyone not to read the closing pages as Socrates drinks the hemlock and not tear up a bit. Um, mm-hmm. but, but the richness I think of the credo in particular is the, the fact that the arguments that he makes feel very contemporary. Mm-hmm. I mean these are, these are the arguments we make today and they, they're convincing for a lot of people and what's wrong with them is not immediately apparent and you, you don't get – sometimes – Plato's stuff, the, the arguments are very weird because you're not an Athenian at the time and so you're not hooked into that culture and so it just seems bizarre but the credo does not feel that way at all. It feels very contemporary and speaks across the millennia to us. Um, and th- These are arguments well worth wrestling with. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.